everyone. Good, good to see you. Good to be with you today. Whew, here we are. First Sunday of Advent. It doesn't seem like it's possible that we are here already. Marcus mentioned that we had a great crew yesterday that came and decorated the church and feels a little bit like we're getting ready for that season, and yet when the sun is shining and it's just hard to imagine that we're just a couple weeks away from Christmas. But you also know that our schedules are getting busier, busier and busier. We made the announcement that our church annual Christmas dinner for adults is Saturday. Coming up on Saturday, the 1st of December. You know why? Because our calendar was already full. And we just kept pushing. We didn't want to push it back to the end of November. Almost did, but we didn't. um, It just had to be in December. But our calendars are already full, and it just seems like season after season, we just get busier and busier and busier. And as we kind of approach this Christmas season, we realize, too, that there is going to be busyness. But in the busyness of the season, we want to be very careful not to miss the wonder of this season. That's why we like to do this, why we like to just use that Advent season and our candles and remind ourselves of the different aspects of the story just so we can pause and be reminded of the wonder of what God has done for us and what he's given to us. This morning, we want to start, as we usually do, with the prophets and that anticipation part of the story and to realize that all of Scripture anticipates the arrival of Christ. I I hope that it's not your attitude and your thinking that, that the Old Testament doesn't really have anything to do with our life in Christ that uh, we are Christians in the New Testament, we're not under the law. And there are some who would just have that attitude to say it really doesn't apply. If that's your attitude, we need to spend some more time together in the Old Testament because it's exciting, because it all points to Christ. The Old Testament points to Christ, and the New Testament points to Christ. We want to spend a little bit of time today just, just exploring that and enjoying that. In fact, this morning, I want to direct our attention to two passages of scripture as we think about anticipating Christ. The the first actually is the gospel of Luke, but I want to go to the very last chapter of the gospel of Luke. I love this story, and there's a phrase here that we're just really going to key in on. We're in the last chapter of Luke, Luke 24. You remember that our Bibles are made up of 66 individual books. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the beginning of all things up to right before the time of Christ. The New Testament is Jesus, the time of Christ, to the end of all things. The New Testament, which is about the last third of your Bible, begins with four gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in Luke, in the last chapter of Luke 24. Let's pick up this story. And and here's what's happened in the unfolding of the life and the ministry of Christ. He's already been born. He's already come to earth. He's already entered into that season of ministry. There was healing. There were miracles. There was teaching. There was proclamation. There was opposition. He was arrested. Went through a mockery of a trial. He was crucified. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And this is where we're picking up this story. We're picking it up kind of at the end of the story of Jesus' ministry. But on that day, there were two men who were on on the road. And it's the road to Emmaus. We're picking this up, Matthew, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13. And it says, behold, two of them were going that very day to the village of Emmaus, which was about seven miles away. That very day, the day that, they, that Mary went to the tomb and, and Peter went to the tomb and John went to the tomb, they discovered it empty and the disciples were thrown into dismay. They couldn't believe what was happening. They couldn't imagine what was going on. And, and they are in confusion. There's that strange mixture of joy and excitement 
mingled with the, the sadness and confusion. They don't know what's happening. On that same day, two of his followers, two men, were on their way to Emmaus. And as we read that account, we see that, that a third man joins them. Let's read that together. Luke 24, starting at verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to the village of Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about the things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these things, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And I love this phrase. I love this. And they stood still looking sad. They were heartbroken. They, they stood still and, and they're looking sad. I just, I just can't imagine what that looks like. They stood and their, their countenance had fallen and they looked at Jesus like, don't you know what's going on? In fact, they said that. And, and one of them said, one of them named Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which has happened here today? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all of the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that, he, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also... Some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early this morning and did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of an angel who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said. But, he, but him they did not see. And he, now Jesus speaks, he said to them, Oh, foolish men, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? And here's the phrase. Here's where we want to focus. And beginning with Moses and with all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scripture. And that account goes on to say, while they were walking this seven-mile journey to Emmaus, he kept teaching and teaching, and it wasn't until they got there that their eyes were open. They realized who it was, and, and after the fact, they said, you know, we should have figured this out because it wasn't our heart burning within us when he was teaching us. Can you imagine being taught the Old Testament by Jesus? And he unfolded the scripture and pointed out how all of Moses and the prophets pointed to him. In fact, how all of scripture pointed to him you know this morning when we when we talk about anticipating christ certainly we have to go back there and realize that all of the old testament anticipates christ the prophet certainly anticipated him and that's the the place where we focus it's the prophet's candle and there are certain prophecies that we like to pull out and we like to review and we are amazed at we think of prophecies like Isaiah in chapter 7, verse 14, that tells us, Then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she'll bear a son. Or the prophecy that Lee read for us this morning, Isaiah chapter 9, that just says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then all of those names that follow that are true of him. We like the prophecies that, uh, of Micah that names Bethlehem as the place of his birth hundreds of years before that time of his birth. There are certain prophecies that we like to point to, but do you realize that there are over 300 prophecies that have already been fulfilled concerning the Christ? There are over 300 prophecies that have already been been fulfilled concerning Christ. Now that should amaze us right there. Now, when we stop and we think about this part of the story, 
We should be amazed by that. If, if it were just a handful of prophecies, if it were just a handful of prophecies, we might look at that and say, wow, what, what an amazing coincidence that is. That, that's pretty amazing that, that one person could fulfill those six, ten prophecies. If it were more than that, if it were a dozen or two dozen, we might say, you know, maybe there's something behind this. Maybe there's a conspiracy behind this. Maybe something has happened to contrive to make that happen. But when we look at the fact that there are 300 prophecies and each of them fulfilled, then we have to come to one conclusion. God is at work here in amazing ways. And really, I think that's the conclusion that we have to come to and why we would come back to this point in this part of the story just to be amazed that God is and has been at work. And our conclusion is that this is not simply an afterthought. This has been his purpose and his plan from the very beginning and God has been faithful to accomplish his purpose and his plan just as he said. We don't want to fall into the, the wrong thinking to assume that God created everything and, and, and it was going to be good and then it got messed up and God says, well, now what am I going to do? And that sending Christ to die for us was plan B or it was an afterthought. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't plan B. This is his purpose from the very beginning and he began to lay it out. Say, this is what I'm doing. And this is what I'm doing. And this is what I'm doing. And in Christ, we see all of that fulfilled. So we understand when we open the Old Testament and we read the prophets that, that it all points to Jesus. But not just the prophets. Because Luke records it this way. And then he began, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of Scripture. The books of Moses, the history. Do you realize that all of the history of Israel points to Jesus. Now, this is the amazing thing about the Word of God. I hold this to be accurate and absolutely true because I have that confidence in who God is. This is God's record of making himself known to us because he wants us to know him. And we can count this to be accurate because God is big enough and strong enough and loving enough and present enough to preserve his word intact for us. So I believe that it's an accurate history. And it says what it means, and it means what it says. But at the same time, while it's an accurate history, God is also big enough to orchestrate that history to point to something else and something bigger. And so as we read the stories, not, not fiction, but as we read the unfolding of God's story, we realize, and some are more clear than others, but we realize that it all points to Jesus, it anticipates Jesus. Some of those things we see really clearly. When we talk about, when we talk about uh, stories like Abraham and his son Isaac, and when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, you know that story. And he's, he's going to be obedient to God, but God stops him. And the question is, where, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And God says, I'm going to provide the lamb. I'm going to provide the sacrifice. A picture, an anticipation of Christ. Some of the stories are, are really clear in their unfolding in anticipation of Christ. The Passover is one of my favorites. As God's people in Israel and God sent those series of plagues, you remember that. And the last plague was that judgment of death that was going to sweep across the land of Egypt. And all of the firstborn in Egypt were to die except for the houses where the blood of a lamb had been applied. And where there was the blood of the lamb, that judgment of death passed over. What an incredibly clear and wonderful picture of what God would provide in that perfect Lamb of God. And we unfold that and we realize that all of those stories, while they are historically accurate, they also point to what God would do in Christ. We realize even the law that was given in the books of Moses, that points to Christ. It's pretty easy to see in the whole sacrificial system over and over again for the sacrifice. It was, it was required that it had to be a perfect sacrifice. It had to be a perfect, spotless 
animal, a spotless lamb to be sacrificed, couldn't be with defect, couldn't be sickly, it couldn't be diseased. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. And even in that whole system that it seems gruesome to us, but there was a requirement of blood. There was a lot of shedding of blood. You know why? Because that was the penalty for sin. Because the requirement of sin, the penalty of sin is death. And it just points to the seriousness of our sin condition and what was going to be required of that and how God was going to fulfill that perfectly. And even in that sacrifice, season after season after season, was an indication that this is not a perfect uh, not a perfect solution, but God himself would provide the perfect solution. It all points to Jesus. I love the story in the Old Testament of, uh, of the tabernacle and later the temple and how God gave very clear and specific instructions of how to build the furniture of the temple and how to arrange the furniture of the temple. Because it's, an all, it's all a picture of how can a sinful man approach a holy God, that place of, of holiness, the holy of holies. And if you could just imagine coming into that tabernacle, into that temple, that the first thing you see is the altar of sacrifice, which tells you something, doesn't it? How can you approach a holy God? Well, first there has to be a sacrifice. And that, that altar of sacrifice just speaks of judgment and sin. And then the next piece of furniture was that the wash basin, the laver. The, the sacrifice has been made, and yet still we have this, this need to make sure our hands are clean and our feet are clean. And then we can come into his presence. And first by just the ministry of the word and the ministry of prayer the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's that holy place, the table of showbread and, and, and the golden lampstand and the altar of incense. It just speaks of that ministry that we have in his presence now. And then one day we get to come into his presence, that holy of holies, and we anticipate that. But that whole picture, do you understand that? The whole picture points to Christ in all of the Old Testament pretty amazing picture. It all points to Jesus. But here's what we want to understand again today. That when we talk about anticipating Christ, it looks back to what the prophets anticipate, but for us it also looks forward. Because I mentioned there are over 300 prophecies that have been fulfilled by Christ, and yet still there are over 400 prophecies that are still pending. And just as I ask our children, can we trust God to fulfill his promises? Absolutely, we can do that. And yet, there's this sense of longing for us. And as we come to this season and, and, and we sing that song, and thank you, Tim and team, for singing that, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. In a sense, we sing that as a Christmas song, and we think about the ex expectation and the longing of Israel for their Messiah, but it's our heart longing, too, for him to come again. I want to look at another passage of Scripture this morning. In Romans, chapter 8. Romans, of course, Paul's letter, probably the most wonderful, most complete explanation of our need for a Savior and how God provided that. Romans chapter 8 starts with that incredible statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then that chapter goes on to talk about this struggle that we have that though we're not condemned, if we've embraced Jesus as our Savior, we're no longer condemned, and yet we still live in a world that is molested by sin. We still live in a sin-dominated world, and we struggle with that. And he speaks of the Holy Spirit's role that we're we're no longer slaves to sin, but what we listen to, we're guided by, we're your slaves to the Holy Spirit. But in the middle of that, in just a few phrases, he talks about this longing and this expectation that we have, waiting for Christ to come back. Let me read these for you. We're, we are jumping in in the middle of a, a thought, in the middle of a presentation, but, but follow this. Chapter 8, starting at verse 19. I, 
Yeah, we'll start at 19. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Paul uses that word groans several times in this short passage in these three verses. Let me just give you the definition of that so we know where we're going here. My idea, my definition, how I describe that, this, this groaning that Paul is describing is this deep, unsettled realization it's an unsettling realization that these things shouldn't be this is not the way it should be that we live in a world and things are not the way they should be and and that groaning is that deep longing for things to be put right that's the groaning so what does he mean when he says all of creation groans for this, this thing to be put right. Kind of interesting to think about this. That Paul says that all of creation, even the physical world, was subjected to the penalty of our sin. Just simply put, we, we understand this, that Everything was created perfectly, and it would have been sustained perfectly had sin not entered the picture. But when sin entered the picture, when Adam and Eve, when man and woman, when mankind chose to rebel against the authority of God, all that was created perfect began to decay. And we live in a world of decay. And we can see it all around us. We, we can see that decay, well, biologically we understand that, this is the, the answer to the question, why is there sickness and disease? Well, because that which was created perfect began to decay. And we live in a decaying world. And I'm not saying that you're sick because you've someplace sinned in your life. I'm saying you live in a world that's dominated by sin, and here's one of the consequences. There's sickness. There's disease. There's suffering. There is hurting. And it shouldn't be. And, and maybe deep in our spirit, we understand that this shouldn't be. But even the created world understands this. It shouldn't be that way. We, we think about that decay. Maybe we could talk about the social decay. The man was created to have a perfect relationship with God, and because of that, have a perfect relationship with each other. We don't have perfect relationships. In fact, the world is decaying socially, and we look at that and just see the world straining and suffering because of that. But think about this. Just let your imagination be stretched a little bit and your thinking be stretched. Even the physical world and the way it works, the way it functions, is suffering and straining. You know, we, we see on the news natural disasters. We see fires and earthquakes and storms and, and climate change. And all of, all of those things that are impacting our world. And, and can we think about that just in this sense that this is a world that is decaying and it shouldn't be. Even the physical world is straining and suffering because of sin. And even the physical world in that sense is, as Paul says, groaning for things to be put right. And it will be put right when Jesus comes back to reign as king. The world groans for that and suffers for that. But not only that, he continues. Look at the next verse, verse 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What is he saying here? We, we have the first fruit. We have the first taste of what it means to be saved. And I'm not saying that we're not fully saved or completely saved, but we've embraced Jesus as Savior. We've believed the promises of God. We are saved by the grace of God 
through faith. We, we've cried out to say, God, let his death count for us. Let his death count for me. God embraces us as his own. And what did he do? He gave us his Holy Spirit as a promise, as a seal of that. We, we can talk about the down payment, the earnest money, the token. We can talk about the first taste. With the Holy Spirit, we have that sense that we belong to God. And Paul would even go on to say, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, ministers to our heart in this world that is, is corrupt, and we struggle with that. The Holy Spirit ministers to our heart, and we're assured that we belong to God, and we long for that. And not only this, Paul says, but we also, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, even we within ourselves groan waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons. We have assurance, but we are not in full possession of that yet. We long for that. And then add to that this idea, and we, I use this phrase a lot, that with the Holy Spirit, we're, we've been given a new operating system, that our old way of thinking changes. We don't have the priorities we used to have. We don't see the world as we used to see it. And the more the Holy Spirit ministers in our life, the more we realize that this world is not the way it should be. That we live in an upside-down world, and it shouldn't be that way. And the more we realize that, the more we long for things to be put right. That we within ourselves groan. There's that deep unsettledness that this is not the way it should be. And we long for the time when Jesus would come back and set it right. Paul uses the phrase one more time. He just talks about the Holy Spirit. Look at this next verse. Starting at verse 26. In the same way, the Holy Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, it's the same thought throughout here. Some look at that and say it's the Holy Spirit praying in a, a spiritual heavenly language. It sounds like groaning. I don't think that's what Paul is saying here. Creation groans to be set right. We groan to be set right. The Holy Spirit, and here's just simply understand this, we still live in a messed up world. And we struggle with that. But in that struggle, we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. And the Holy Spirit of God that is within us, who works for us, longs even more than we long for things to be put right. There's a longing. There's a waiting. There is an expectation for things to come and to be made right. You know, when we talk about the prophets, when we talk about Jesus coming the first time, it always has to also be in our mind that he's promised to come again, and we long for that. Just as the Old Testament saints long for his appearing, we long for his appearing, for things to be set right. You know, it's that appearing that satisfies that, that emptiness in our lives satisfies that and, and even now we realize that there is a world around us that is empty and longing for something to fill that up we realize that in Christ we find the satisfaction of that we never want to lose that I want to just wrap this up I'm going to ask Victor to come Victor is one of our elders I, I love this brother I want him to come and just tell part of his story of how God got a hold of his life and, and filled what was missing there. So are you gonna are you gonna work are you gonna translate for him? Are you gonna do it in, in Spanish or in English? <laughs> All right. So Victor, share part of your story with us, how God got a hold of you. He probably speaks better English than me, so <laughs> <laughs> My name is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you. I'm from Michoacan, Mexico. So I want to share my story. Somos cinco hermanos en la familia. Yo soy el número tres. 
We are five brothers in our family, and I'm, I'm the third one. I grew up in a Catholic uh, home, place. <laughs> in which we were taught to go to you know, mass and do the things that they will tell us to do. And I will ask my mom and my grandma, why do we do that? Why do we pray for the death ones? Why do I do uh, my first communion? And they will explain some things, but they, some other things they will not explain to me because they, they didn't know. And as I grew up, I didn't have any hope in anything. When I would watch TV and see saw some programs or announcements, like seeing McDonald's, McDonald's. All of my brothers wanted to go to McDonald's, <laughs> but I never had a desire for it because I saw my reality. And I will say, you know, I will think that in Mexico I will never go to have the opportunity to go to a McDonald's. And my father helped me a lot to set, uh, put apart reality and wishful thinking. And my father would, used to tell me, you will always stay here. Don't have dreams. We are poor. You don't have the opportunity to do things. And talking yesterday uh, with my wife, I think I was exploited by my father a lot. He didn't allow me to dream. He didn't allow me like to play. He will make me do uh, work for an older man when I was a child. When I was 13, I started uh, bringing money to my my home. I stopped uh, studying, going to school, because we couldn't, I couldn't go to school. When I was like between 13 and 14, I began using all kinds of drugs. Because you know, when I, where the place where I uh, come from, many people who live here in the States go down there and they will show you uh, what life is like here in the States. Many gang members had the use of drugs. Uh, I was once asked in a family reunion, what do you want to be when you get older? And I said, I want to be a marijuana user. Y todos se de mí. And they all laughed at me. And you know, last month I went back to California. My uncles and my cousins asked me, do you remember what you said when you were uh, younger? And I said, yes, I remember. And I was. But I'm not proud of that. And 
uh, when I got a little older, I started attending a this uh, youth group of Catholic young men. Yo le preguntaba al padre de la iglesia católica, ¿por qué hacemos esto? ¿Por qué tenemos que rezar? ¿Por qué tenemos que hacer lo otro? You know, and I started asking questions to the priest, why do we have to pray? Why do we have to do these things? In the beginning, he will answer all my questions, but then he got upset with me. Y le dijo a la señora, muchas cosas. And he said, viene, o yo vengo. Tú And he said to this lady, you know, Victor is asking so many questions. So whether Victor comes or I come, you know, to this group. <laughs> and I said, but I said, but I have questions. I would like to know. And when I came to the States, you come to a place where you don't know the language, you don't know anybody, you seem, you, uh, it's like everything against, is against you. Yo me solo. And I felt lonely. Yo a I was missing my family. Me sin And I felt without hope. <coughs> and some friends began to invite me to come to church Pero yo decía, yo a Dios. but I was saying I know God no I don't need I, I know who God is Un día vine. I came one day al Giro. I met Pastor Giro And I, and I began to listen about God, about Jesus, about his love for me, about forgiveness. Entonces yo que yo no a Dios. And then I understood that I didn't know God. La es que yo nunca a Dios. Truth is, I never saw after God. Yo and creí que a Dios. I thought I knew God. God is, God is the one who came to my life. I didn't look for him. My wife knew who I was down in Mexico. She knew that I was a drug addict and what she was going to deal with by being with me. And she accepted me that way. And when I got to study the Bible, then I realized that I didn't want to be a husband using drugs or a father using drugs. Because my wife already had the experience of living with a father who was a drug addict. And because of that, I gave thanks to God for reaching out to me and for getting me out from the life where I was. Now I can say that I really know God, that I know Jesus. That I have a relationship with him as a friend and father to a son. Ahora a Dios. And I really know God now. Tengo un que se en de I have a Bible verse which is in Second Corinthians, cinco, chapter 5:17. In Spanish. Uh -huh. If you are in Christ, in Christ, you are a new creature. The old things are gone, passed away, and everything is made new. 
We have one more. Philippians 1.6. being persuaded of this that he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it yeah. okay. and we wrap that up when we think about the prophet's candle we think about the anticipation from of old, the anticipation of the Old Testament of those, those saints longing for the promised Messiah. We look forward and we, we think, we long for the time when all will be set right. And the longer we live in a messed up, upside down world, the more we long for that. But then we also realize this. There's a world around us that is longing for something. And the answer that they're going to find is in Christ. So at this season, we get to be about that and tell that story over and over again. Amen? Father, we thank you for your goodness always. We thank you for this season to celebrate your greatest gift for us, the sending of your own son for that one specific purpose of dying in our place. We would pray that you would give us opportunity to tell the story over and over again of your love expressed. Right there. We would pray that the blessing would continue to pour upon us and give us those opportunities to be about your story. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.